So today we're going to finish up the notes. Your chapter review is due next week. What did I write down? Wednesday? Tuesday or Wednesday, I think. Somewhere in there. Um, so first we're going to talk about the VSCPR theory, and then we're going to look at intermolecular forces. The VSCPR theory stands for the valence shell electron pair repulsion. So it has to do um, with the valence shell electrons. Because they're all negatively charged, they want to repel each other and be as far apart, oriented as far apart from each other as possible. Um, so they're going to arrange themselves, the bonds in a molecule will arrange themselves so that they are far away from each other, at the largest angles possible um, between the different bonds. So, I can't quite switch it, can I? So some examples of uh, CO2, um, if you look at the Lewis structure, so we're going to have to write Lewis structures for these to figure out what kind of shape they will, will um, show. We have to, um, carbon dioxide has a carbon in the center with a double bond to two oxygens. So it looks like this. And we are going to use the chart on page. <coughs> on page 200, there's a chart that we're going to use. Um, so what you're going to look at is first, how many atoms are bonded to the central atom? So how many atoms are bonded to this central atom? Not how many bonds, how many atoms are bonded to it? Two. Two. 200. And then you look at how many lone electron or unshared electron pairs are there around the central atom, just the central atom? Zero. So on that chart, you're going to go down atoms bonded to the central atom, the second column. You're going to look for two. There's a couple that are two. And we have zero lone pairs. So the very first um, row has the two and zero. And so that will tell you what sort of shape you would have and the geometry. And that would be then linear. B E. What? I'd change it to this. Change it to this. Okay, B F three. We'd have something that looks like this. Boron is one of the exceptions. It can hold be stable at just six. So, we look at how many atoms are bonded to the central atom. How many are there? How many atoms bonded to the central atom? Two. Three. We have one, two, three. And how many lone pairs on the central atom? None. So, you'd look on your chart. 
and look for a three and zero. And it looks like that is the second row down. And it tells us the shape then is trigonal planar, which is how they would get trigonal planar here. Trigonal planar. Yeah, there we go. So CH4, yeah, it does give it to us. So here's the Lewis structure for CH4. How many atoms are bonded to the central atom? Four, and how many lone pairs? Or how many unshared pairs? Zero. So you'd look for four and zero, and on your chart, that should say tetrahedral as the shape. So that's how we're getting those shapes. So where's this? It's on the chart? On page 200. Go back. Now, alone pairs um, are the are the pairs that are not being shared. So I think, does it call it lone pairs on that? Yeah, they call them lone pairs. They're also called unshared pairs just because they're not bonded to another atom. But they will influence the shape of the molecule. So like H2O, if we look at its Lewis structure, H2O would look like this. So how many atoms are bonded to the central atom? And how many lone pairs? How many lone pairs? Two lone pairs, because you were looking at pairs, not just electrons. So we'd have one pair, and here's one pair. So you would look on your chart for two set bonded to the central atom, two lone pairs, and that would show you that we're bent. Yes, probably, yes. Well, no, because I can't say that. Because sulfur can hold extra valence electrons, and so it can have more than just eight. So you may have more than that. But it's one of the exceptions. Okay, NH3 looks like this, where we'd have hydrogen, nitrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. So we'd have three atoms bonded to the central atom and one lone pair. And we look on your chart, that would tell you it's trigonal pyramidal. Now, in these, they're like generic equations, um, a type. The E2 means two lone pairs of electrons. The E's are pairs of electrons. So means there's two lone pairs, there's one lone pair. That is, that um, type is also on your, on that chart. And the unshared electrons actually repel, repel each other more strongly than bonded electrons. And double and triple bonds, we've already seen, will be treated like single bonds. So we're counting the atoms bonded to the central atom, not how many bonds there are. So let's use that chart to predict the molecular geometry for these atom or these molecules. So AlCl3 Wait a second here. There we go. So we have Al has how many valence electrons? 3 And chlorine has seven. So one, two, three, four, five. Ah. Three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three.
Okay, so here's the Lewis structure. How many atoms are bonded to the central atom? Oh, aluminum you can is a, one of the exceptions. It's stable with just six valence electrons. Um, halogens really, well, they don't form double bonds. So we, you can kind of see that. That's how you would figure out that this would be stable with only six because chlorines are all halogens and chlorines don't form double bonds. So you can't add any more electrons to aluminum by forming double bonds. So aluminum's stable with six and it is one of the exceptions. So how many atoms are bonded to that central atom? Three, and how many lone pairs around the central atom? Zero, so what kind of geometry would it have? We're gonna do a lab on um, Monday and Tuesday, so you're gonna be able to build these molecules, and you'll see what trigonal planar looks like. So trigonal planar actually would kind of, the bond angles, would look more like that instead of straight across and down because it needs to be 120 degrees between each. Okay. Three of those are aligned, so it's straight Mm-hmm. So this next one will be void. This next one won't be because it's not going to be You could, yep, it probably will be because we have, it'll look like this. So now one, two, three, four, five, six, and then the seventh one was here. So bromine, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six. No, that that one really there was no central atom because there's only two atom, two of them. So I don't know that one. Cross that one out. So this one. CBr4 has how many atoms bonded to the central atom? And how many lone pairs? So that is what geometry? Tetrahedral. Yep. Um, let's skip AlBr3 also because Bromine is also a halogen. It's going to look exactly like the first one so, since it's also a halogen. So SF6. Now this is one. Sulfur has six electrons, six valence electrons, and each of those electrons is going to share with fluorine. So this is an example where it's going to have an expanded octet, it's called. It's going to hold more than eight. So we'd have one, two, three, four, five, six. And each of those are bonded to a fluorine. So we're going to end up looking like this. So how many atoms are bonded to the central atom? Six, and how many lone pairs are around the central atom? Around the sulfur, how many lone pairs are lone pairs? Six, six central atom or six atoms bonded to the central atom, and zero, zero. So six and zero on your chart tells us it's what shape? Octahedral. Yep. Octahedral. Okay, CH2Cl2. So we have carbon in the center, we'd have hydrogen Hydrogen, chlorine, and chlorine. So we're going to have something that looks like this. So how many atoms are bonded to the central atom? Four. 
And how many lone pairs? Zero. So this would be? Tetrahedral. Good. Let's see the next one. A few more here. Oh, we did CO2 already. That was one of the f original examples. I'll draw it up real quick again, though. Looks like so. So, what? Oh, it's like 156 pounds. So there's two atoms bonded. There were no lone pa pairs, and this was linear. Okay, C, CO3 with a minus one charge. So we have chlorine in the center with seven valence electrons. Um, let's put oxygens around the side. So this oxygens have six, so one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, five, six. So we would have bonds here, and we get to add one electron. We'll add it over here on the left. So now we have octets around all of them. And our minus one on the outside. And how many ab atoms are bonded to the central atom? Three. And how many lone pairs? One. So what type of shape would this be? Three and one. Mm-hmm. Trigonal pyramidal. Two more. SF2, S has six valence electrons. In this case, we're not having an expanded octet. We're just going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So how many atoms bonded to the central atom? Two, and how many lone pairs? Two. So what kind of shape? Bent or angular? We'll just put bent. And the last one, PCL3. Um, phosphorus has five valence electrons. And CL, CL, CL. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So how many atoms are bonded to that central atom? And how many lone pairs? So what kind of shape is it? Yep. Trigonal pyramidal. You guys won't have to memorize that chart. You'll always have access to one. Quizzes and tests will have copies for you, so you don't have to. You don't have to memorize it or anything. So. Um, to explain the shapes of the atoms or the molecules that we see, um, we use hybridization, which is where two or more atomic orbitals of similar energies on the same atom produce new orbitals of equal energies. Basically, if we have equal energies, we're like in the third energy level. So our 3s and 3p um, orbitals, sublevels, combine, combine to form this hybrid sub. Uh, sublevel. So here in CH4, um, carbon has how many valence electrons? It has four, doesn't it? 
So let's draw out the valence electrons, what it would look like. Now normally we filled the S first and then the P sublevel, but what actually happens is that it, they hybridize, the S and P orbitals hybridize, so they feel like they're at equal energy levels, so we'd have our four valence electrons filling in this direction, which allows for four different bonds, which is why it's CH4. So this hybrid orbital is called sp3 because we have one electron in the s orbital and three electrons in the p orbitals there. Nitrogen has five valence electrons, so we'd add just a fifth electron and we'd refill again. We're not talking, it's not s2p3, it's how many orbitals have electrons in it, so it is also still sp3. If we were looking at boron, these are our orbitals. Boron only has three valence electrons, so here would be the valence electrons. What hybridization would that be? sp2, because there's only two electrons in the p sublevel. And so this explains why boron is stable with only six electrons because we can form three bonds and it's stable that way. Here's a picture of like an sp um, hybrid orbital. Looks like this. Here's your sp2 and sp3. Okay. Um, and then. We're going to go quickly through the intermolecular forces. We don't have to, we aren't going to go through any real detail here, um, just so that you know the terminology, uh, because we'll use polarity a lot more later on. Uh, so intermolecular forces are forces between molecules, just like intramural sports are, are when like one school plays another, but intramural would be the within the same school playing against each other. Um, so intermolecular forces are between molecules. Intramolecular forces are the bonding that holds the molecule together. Um, we use boiling point to measure that attraction, but there's these three types of bonds, dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, and London dispersion forces. Um, dipole-dipole is the strongest. What happens is there's, um, we've already looked with electronegativity when we form the type of bond, there's a polar bond and ionic bonds, they form kind of more, one atom is more negative than the other. And so um, because one is more negative than the other, it kind of has a slight attraction to another polar molecule. So the positive end of one polar molecule is attracted to the negative end of another polar molecule. And so that is called a dipole-dipole force when they're being held together because of the polar bonds. Okay, um, they cause higher boiling points because those at or those molecules hold on to each other a lot strongly stronger and it's harder to get one molecule to escape the surface of the liquid because they're holding on to each other stronger and so it's got a higher boiling point. It, cause, it takes more energy to make it boil. Hydrogen bonding um, is basically a dipole-dipole, just a special case when hydrogen is evolved in a, in a bond and it's a polar bond, it can just cause hydrogen bonding, but it's the same type of idea where you have one one part of the one atom in a bond is more negative than the other, so that part is attracted to another um, positive end of another polar molecule. And this hydrogen bonding is what gives water its special characteristics. Why water has a high boiling point? Why water has um, why it's ice is more is less dense than solid or than liquid water? It's because of this hydrogen bonding that occurs. 
Uh, so I think this is a picture, yeah, this is water. And so the red uh, spheres are the, the red dots are oxygen, the white dots are hydrogen, and it just arranges itself so that the hydrogens are next to oxygens and oxygens are next to hydrogens. And when it becomes ice, it's more rigid in its structure and it causes these little air packets, which makes it less dense, which makes ice float instead of sink. Got it? Okay. Then the last force is London dispersion force, and it's the weakest force out of all of them. Um, it's the only force that in, can occur between two nonpolar. So even though nonpolar atoms are, um, don't have a more negative or positive end, the electrons are still moving. And so for a split second, the electrons may have a unequal distribution, and that's just a split second London dispersion force that can occur, but it's very short-lived, um, very temporary, and it's the only intermolecular force that acts in noble gases. Noble gases are um, nonpolar, usually. They aren't attracted to, they don't form bonds, they don't, they're very stable on their own but they can have some intermolecular forces. And I think that's it, yep. Um, so for those last three, just dispersion, the, the intermolecular forces, what you really just need to know is what, just terminology, what they mean, not necessarily um, we aren't really doing anything with them, okay?